Good morning, everyone. We'd like to start our service off by welcoming all of our first time guests and visitors with us here today. If it is your very first time with us, we want to connect with you. We'd love for you to take the card that's in the seat back in front of you that has two QR codes on it. One of those QR codes will take you directly to our website where you can fill out an online form that we can get some information about you to follow up later on. The other side of that card is the physical version of that form that you can also fill out. And after the service is over, be sure to stop by the welcome desk, which is in our lower lobby, because we have a gift we want to give you just to say thanks for joining us today. The second QR code on that card also takes you to our e-bulletin, which you're going to hear throughout our announcement video this morning. One thing you may have noticed is that our children seem to be in our service rather than in Sunday school. And for the entire summer, we're giving all of our Sunday school teachers a break so that we can all gather as full families here in the sanctuary for worship on Sunday mornings. If you have children who are ages five and up, they are welcome to join us in our service, just like normal. But if you have children that are age four and younger, our nursery is still open and staffed. So if you have any need to drop those age groups off, you can make sure to do that at any time. If there's any need for you to step out during the service, our service is being live streamed into our upper lobby. So you can be sure to not miss any of the service in case you do have to step out. All right, everyone. Our next churchwide fellowship event is one week from today. That is Sunday, August the 13th, and it will be a float trip down the Schuylkill River. We will meet at the boat ramp at the Exeter Scenic Trail that's over in Gibraltar at 1.45 p.m. We'll put all our flotation devices in the water there and we will float down to the takeout at Union Meadows, which is behind Monty's Mulch. It'll be about a three hour float. We would love to have anybody come that is interested. If you are interested, please let Keith Stutzman know today. After the float, when we get out of the water down in Union Meadows, we'll have a cookout. So if you'd like to come and just hang out at the cookout, but you don't really want to do the float trip, you're, you're invited to do that as well. So again, you can either let Keith Stutzman know or you can sign up online in today's e-bulletin or you can sign up in either lobby today on the paper sign-up sheet. We have another fellowship event happening at the end of August, which is going to be here at the church and it's gonna be a wiffle ball tournament. We're just gonna have a good time playing some wiffle ball, eating some food and fellowshipping together. Everybody is welcome to join, but not everyone is expected to play wiffle ball. So what we'd ask is if you plan on attending, make sure that you sign up in either lobby. We have a physical form or you can sign up in the e-bulletin and let us know if you plan on participating in the wiffle ball or if you just plan on attending. And either way, no matter who comes, we'd love for everyone to plan on bringing a side dish or something to share as we plan on eating some food together as well. The date for that is August 27th here at the church at 5 p.m. Ladies, our next Connections event will be on Tuesday, August 15th at 6.30 p.m. That's different than what we normally do. Normally we have our events on a Saturday, but this time it will be on a Tuesday evening. We'll head out to Shell's Mini Golf on Fifth Street Highway and play around a mini golf and then enjoy some ice cream together afterwards. They do ask that you sign up for this event. So again, you can do that in today's e-bulletin or you can sign up on the paper sheet in either lobby today. One more quick thing before we finish out the announcement video, Pastor Bill has a quick update about some signage that we're about to be putting up around the building. So let's check that out. Hey, good morning, church. Uh, I just wanted to give you guys a heads up that there's gonna be something that you're gonna see around the campus next week that is a little bit different. We're gonna be putting some signs up, uh, either entering the gym or entering down into the section where the families tend to go with their children for Sunday school. And these signs are really just posting that these are gonna be restricted areas as far as photography goes. Downstairs where all the children are, we're gonna at this point not allow photography whatsoever. And in the gym area, there's gonna be events that we have groups and things like that. But we're gonna ask that while children are present, we do not take pictures. And the reason for this is legally, there's just a lot of complications as far as taking pictures of children and posting them on the internet, as well as we're not always aware of what everybody's family situation is, especially visitors. And there are certain things with families, especially those that have adoption or foster care, where you cannot put things online. And so in order to keep everybody safe and to have an environment where children can feel safe and families feel completely protected, we're gonna ask that everybody stick with those signs and avoid taking pictures, especially in the areas where the signage is posted. Again, this is really just for protection of people. If anybody has any questions or concerns about this, please let us know. Uh, but this will be starting next week. We will remind you over the next couple of weeks, but you will start to see these signs posted. And we really ask that you stick with this. Thank you. 
Those are all the announcements we have for today. We encourage you to check out our weekly e-bulletin. And you can do that by pulling the card out of the seat in front of you and scanning the QR code that will take you directly to our weekly e-bulletin. Or you can check it out online at our website and that is www.exeterbfc.org backslash bulletins. It'll tell you everything we have going on, everything that's coming up. And one other thing that we like to mention occasionally is we do have a bulletin board in our upper lobby where people can post things, uh, maybe things they have for sale, maybe job opportunities, maybe an event coming up that they're hosting that they'd like to invite you to. There's actually a few things on that bulletin board today. So we would encourage you to pop over and check that out sometime if you've never done that. And if you have an interest in posting anything on that bulletin board, feel free to reach out to the church office staff and let us know so we can approve it and get it put up for you. At this time, we invite you to stand and greet your neighbor before we continue in our time of worship. morning again. You find your way back to your seats and we open here with worship. Let's just remember exactly why we've gathered here that we serve a God who is worthy to be praised and as we exalt his name we can be reminded of how great he is. As we sing this first song, he is exalted. We go into great are you Lord, declaring that it's his breath in our lungs and he created us for worship and then we'll finish before the prayer with a hymn, Great is the Lord. But let's lift our voices together and recognize how great our God is. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He is exalted forever, exalted and I.
especially resonate with us, that it's his breath that gives us power, gives us the ability to praise. Let's sing. You give life, you are love. the singing that we use that breath for, but it's exactly how we live our lives, that our bodies are a sacrifice. Let's declare that together.
sing this next song. If you would like to use your hymnals, we'll be singing hymn 31, Great is the Lord. Let's continue to lift our voices and make this continued declaration that our God is great. He's worthy of this praise. Let's sing together. as we move into our time of morning prayer and offering. Let's bow our heads as we go before the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you so much that we can gather here this morning and we can sing these songs to be able to declare praises to you um, as one body, but also, God, to recognize that it doesn't matter what we do or um, what we're going through, God, you're still worthy and great to be praised. I pray that no matter what we're dealing with and experiencing, I know we can carry heavy burdens, especially walking into this place on a Sunday morning, God, but I pray that you would continue to be our comfort, that you would be our peace, and that no matter what we are feeling or experiencing, God, that we can still sing these songs and the words in them, and we can understand and mean them, even if we don't grasp what it truly means to lose ourselves entirely for you, God. We thank you for the, the sacrifice that was paid. Um, God, it was great. It was something just incredibly um, amazing, and we praise you for that this morning. As we bring our burdens before you, God, I pray that we would lay them at your feet, whatever that may look like, whether it's our own personal struggles and issues and the sin that we continually um, seek instead of uh, pursuing you first, God. I, I pray that you would allow us to have, have the ability to drop those things with an understanding that you are greater. God, if it's, if it's physical needs that we have, we pray for your healing, but ultimately we also pray for your glory to be to be shown um, even through the pain, even through the struggle, um, as, we, as we believe that you can use those things for your kingdom and for your good. God, whatever it may be that we're dealing with, um, I just pray that you would shine through all of that, that our focus and our hearts would be on you, that as we're here this morning, and not just this morning, God, but in our lives, that we can take what we have here, this worship, this time to dig into your word and understand more of who you are, that we can take that and apply it, that our desires and the hearts um, would be just entirely dedicated to serving you. Um, so God, show us more of who you are. Show us more of your spirit. Remind us of how, how much you provide and how much you have a plan for us. Um, give us the ability to seek that and uh, see part of your kingdom continually here on earth um, as we seek you first, God. We thank you for this morning and pray that whatever is given here, whether it's even just with our own uh, lives, God, I pray that it would be something that glorifies you and that we would take um, take what is given and it would it would be to further your kingdom, um, whether it's through blessing others, God, um, but ultimately the world wants, we want to see them know you more. Um, thank you for calling us to be a part of that, God, and we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. As those containers are being passed, we will continue with another song. If you're able to stand, please join us as we sing, You Are My King.
morning. Let's, uh, let's start with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, again, I pray as we dive into your word, um, Lord, through some admitted, admittedly tough texts, um, Lord, I pray that I would stay true to what you are saying in it through Jude. Lord, I pray that um, study would come to fruition here today. Lord, that I would have the constitution to teach your word, even when it offends. And Lord, may we always stay true to what your word says. And Lord, I pray that you would open my eyes if I am one of these individuals. Um, Lord, it says about our own self-deception. Lord, especially as we talk about preachers and teachers. Lord, I pray that it's not me. And I pray that each person in this room would grasp what is being said today. Lord, I pray that anything of me would be forgotten, but that your truth would change us forever. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're going to be in Jude, and again, believe it or not, I mean, as slow as it started, we covered, uh, what, four verses last week, and we're going to cover four verses this week. Um, And I actually believe I'm going to do it in a halfway decent amount of time. Now, what that means, decent amount of time, is subjective, but... um, We will try to do it in a good amount of time. So let's start with this uh, because it's really a lot of what we're talking about today. Um, I'll I'll even start with a show of hands. Genuinely, who who likes truth? We all say us, right? But it really depends on the context because there is just some part of us that genuinely hates truth. I mean, we can go into the deep theological aspect of it and sin and our rejection of God's truth, which, of course, we're going to talk about today. But I think, really, it permeates just about every area of our lives because we say, yes, I love truth, I want to hear truth, but while this joke is old, some of you all have actually been in this conundrum where the wife asks the husband, how do I look? You're not looking for the response to be, you know, well, you're not in your 20s, or, you know, that that's not your best outfit. Um... There's those kinds of things which somebody like me should learn over the years, but like I just, I have that broken filter where I'm just like, eh, you look all right. Um, No, I'm just kidding. It's my wife. I always say she looks amazing. But, um, you know, we, we really do do that. And especially when it comes to all different kinds of things like our own athletic ability or our own intelligence or musical talent, whatever it is, we tend to 
not actually want to hear straight truth. American Idol, uh, I think it's still on, but was such a popular show when it first came out, I think mainly because people on that show were terrible. Those first couple seasons, some of the most watched videos were the people that got up and that were just utterly awful singers. And you genuinely think then, is this all made up or those real singers? Like, who could have not told them at some point, listen, you can't sing. But the reality is, especially in America, I mean, we don't tell people that. We say, hey, you can be whatever you want. As long as you put enough effort into it, you're going to become this X, Y, Z. And it's just not true. It's really not true. Oftentimes, the most loving thing you can do is give somebody a little dose of reality. When I was a youth pastor in California, I had a guy, I won't give his name, but he was an 11th grader. And we had a very serious small group discussion as to, hey, even in 11th grade, you really ought to start thinking what's, what's next in life. And he's like, well, I'm going to go to college and I'm going to go on a, a basketball scholarship and I'm going to play for the NBA. And I'm like, okay. Um, Tom, well, I almost said his name. Uh, sir, we've played basketball in youth group before. No offense, but why do you think you're going to play in the NBA? And he's like, because that's what, that's what God made me to do. Like, genuinely, we're having this conversation. And I'm like, so you're what, five foot 10, five foot 11? He's like, yeah. I'm like, can you dunk? He's like, no. I'm like, well, you're in 11th grade and you can't dunk, so you're already like almost impossible for you to make it. So are you like starter at your school or what? Because we're in the middle of nowhere, Central California. Uh, you at least start for your, well, no, I'm 11th grade. I start for the JV team. So I'm like, you haven't even made varsity in 11th grade in a no-name school in the middle of nowhere. And you genuinely believe that when we're talking about what's your future, and I mean, the reason I bring him up is because he was so aggressive about it. Like, my mom tells me this all the time, but that's all I'm going to do with my life. I'm going to be an NBA player. And unequivocally, there's literally no possibility that he was ever going to play in the NBA. And yet, he's like, that's what I'm going to be. That's what I'm going to do. And my final example is, again, there's so many in the military, but I was utterly amazed in boot camp when I ran into this thing that I never thought possible. Because I still was naive, and that was my first real dealings with government. And I actually thought people were like honorable just because they filled a position or an office that had somebody at one point do something honorable in it. Like, i.e., I think that, you know, back then I was like, if you're a Marine, just because you're a Marine, you must be an honorable individual. And I realized very quickly that's not true, especially because the first people you deal with in the military are recruiters. I mean, if you think politicians can lie, man, recruiters got them beat. I think you should, have, you should be a recruiter before a politician. And so there are all these individuals in boot camp. This is what absolutely amazed me. And what also amazed me, not just what I'm about to talk about, but other people down at boot camp, especially Paris Island, they also were confused by this, is that they would get individuals that come, they get pushed through this whole process. They arrive on Paris Island. And one of the first things you have to do is, you know, PT. You have to go do pull-ups and things like that. Well, we've got individuals who came to do one pull-up. Well, at the very least, they're not going to graduate if you, can't do le- if you can't do more than three. And, I mean, they're not going to help you. They're not going to push this. Like, you have to be at least in some sort of shape, shape if you can't run a mile in a certain amount of time. And you had all these individuals. Like, you had kids that are seriously 18 years old standing there like, I've never done a pull-up in my life. Why are you trying to do, tell me to do a pull-up? And everybody's standing around like, what did you think you were getting into? Like, this is the Marines. You've never done a pull-up. And the recruiter has to sign paperwork that says you were able to pass the minimum. And yet there were countless, and I genuinely mean countless individuals, that do not get to graduate because they cannot pass the minimum requirements of some of the tests, physical or mental. But the recruiter didn't care because the recruiter wanted one thing. He wanted higher numbers. His promotions or his bonuses came on how many people he got in. And so he would change paperwork or he'd have them pass medical stuff or have them skip medical things or just write, yes, they can do three pull-ups. And then when somebody comes to question them, they just say, well, they must have had a really good day that day when they did the three pull-ups. It was just all lies. But why were the lies? Because the individual telling the lies had an objective. And so what we're going to talk about today, what Jude talks about, is that there are many reasons why people distort God's truth or the truth, but especially God's truth. We're going to look at three of them today, and the real main point by the end is to give you guys ideas of who should I be listening to and what are the telltale signs of a wolf. When is a wolf in sheep's clothing? Because we dress 
like sheep. We talk like sheep. We mingle among you like sheep. Yet how do you know if I'm a wolf? How do you know if the individual that you're listening to, and we live in a day and age that is the most accessible to information of all of humanity. You guys can jump online and get teaching from any single person. And they may sound like a sheep and they may look like a sheep and they may say all these things that are actually wolf-like. And so we want to look at what Jude says. Here's basically how to spot a wolf, but we've got to go through some texts that are kind of confusing first. So let's read Jude 8 through 11. We will touch slightly on Satan and Michael arguing over the body of Moses, and then we'll really get to the heart of it. Please, again, don't get caught up in the, what's going on with Satan and Michael. But starting in verse 8, Yet in the same manner these men, also by dreaming, defile the flesh and reject authority and revile angelic majesties. But Michael, the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these men revile the things which they do not understand and the things which they know by instinct. Like unreasoning animals, by these things they are destroyed. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the air of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. So again, last week we looked at how these individuals can preach and teach and act and that they try to basically get to the point of, hey, your status is going to save you. And that there are these individuals that while they were given a direct ordainment by God to stay within a certain bounds, they went outside of it. Clearly in humanity, homosexuality is wrong, and yet Sodom and Gomorrah had their issues. And then you've got the angels chasing after strange flesh. And then you had the Israelites who were saying, hey, I'm a Jew, therefore I'm guaranteed to be saved. And Jude says, hey, don't be fooled. Read the Old Testament. Most of them were destroyed because of their unbelief. Again, as we talk about truth, while almost everybody in this uh, sanctuary raised their hand that I appreciate truth, every time we see truth presented in the Bible, we see it as a minority, and that minority is hated, attacked, or killed. I mean, we looked at Joshua and Caleb saying, hey, God promised us this, let's go do it, and what was the audience's response? Let's get stones and kill them. We're also going to see this type of response today as we look at different spots within the Bible But that's what we covered last week. So this week, he's continuing on with these false preachers. What other things may we see in a false preacher? How may they live? Well, he says right here, in the same manner, these men also by dreaming. What does that mean by dreaming? Because there's a lot of different things that we could fill in, and especially in America, we could try to think of what does this, what is this talking about? Well, dreaming is that they claim divine revelation is that there are individuals that are saying that God has given me a special word, and this special word is, and then they go on and spread this special word. And Jude is saying, these men are false preachers, and you need to watch out for them. But they typically start with, God has given me some sort of special message. How do we know this? Well, we see throughout all of the Bible that God can and does speak through dreams. So it's certainly a possibility. And again, Satan's no fool. When he spreads a message, it's about 99% truth and 1% error, but that 1% really drastically changes things. See, in Daniel 1, 1, 17, or Daniel 1, verse 17, it says, and as for these four youths, if you'll remember, you know, Daniel and his friends got taken over to Babylon, says, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom. Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. And then you'll, you're, if you recall throughout the rest of Daniel, different periods there are dreams, and Daniel is actually able to tell what those dreams specifically meant and that God was speaking through dreams. Or perhaps you will recall Joseph and all of the different times that Joseph had a dream that was from God. So therefore, can God communicate through dreams? Absolutely. In fact, Joel 2.28 says this as a prophecy, a promise for the future. And it will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Now fast forward to the New Testament. Do we see this within the New Testament? Do we see dreams and God communicating through dreams? Matthew 120 When he had considered this, Joseph was considering divorcing Mary. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, 
For that which has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. I'm sure many of you can think of a lot of different scenarios where in God's word, an angel comes down and delivers God's word. That's what angel means, messenger. Their job is to go and say to humans, this is God's message. And so all throughout the Bible, we see what angels are doing is delivering God's message, sometimes through dreams, oftentimes through dreams. Look at Acts 2, 16 through 17. On the screens, we have 17. But again, in this context, you remember Acts 2 is Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit comes down, and these men are speaking in tongues. They're speaking in foreign languages, and people from foreign lands are understanding it in their own language. Some really unique stuff is happening, and this is specifically what Peter says and what is being written here in Acts, but this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. Again, Peter says, hey, we knew this was coming. These people aren't drunk. They're fulfilling prophecy as we just read in Joel 2.28, that there will be, God will pour out his spirit and men will dream dreams. And he goes on to quote it. Verse 17, it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit upon all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. So again, we see without, throughout the Bible that does God communicate through dreams? Absolutely. So when a preacher stands up and says, God has given me a word, or I had a dream last night, then really, isn't that kind of a trump card? Because like, who can actually go up to somebody else and say, I don't think God did actually give you that dream. It's really hard to argue that other than using God's word. Because people love to say what God told them in a dream, but I can't argue that because I wasn't in that dream. I have no clue what they dreamed about. So their argument is, hey, throughout scripture, we see that God gave us revelation through dreams. But let's look at something else. Let's look at Jeremiah 23 and then bring it back to the context of Jude. Jeremiah 23, verse 25 through 32. This is the Lord speaking. He says, I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy falsely in my name, saying, I had a dream, I had a dream. How long? Is there anything in the hearts of the prophets who prophesy falsehood, even these prophets of the deception of their own heart, who intend to make my people forget my name by their dreams, which they relate to one another, just as their fathers forgot my name because of Baal? The prophet who has a dream may relate his dream. In other words, God's saying, let him, let him spout his dream. But let him who has my word speak my word in truth. What does straw have in common with grain? In other words, straw, grain, you know, it all looks really the exact same until you throw it up in the wind. When you're separating the chaff from the wheat and things like that, the chaff, the straw, it just blows away, but the actual grains fall down and they have a use while the straw and the chaff really has no use other than feeding animals. It's really useless. But it looks the same at first. It's hard to separate which is what. He says, but how do you know the difference between what these individuals are saying, this is what God told me, and what God actually says? Verse 29, is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer which shatters a rock? Man, I love that verse. I mean, people come to me all the time, what else can I say to somebody? What, what, if, what, what can I do to help somebody that doesn't know the Lord know the truth? Tell them God's word. Because it is a hammer, shatters a sinful nature. Nothing else can. There is, no, there is no certain phrase you need to use. There is no book that you should have read. There is no special words. It's God's word. God's word changes people. We need to stay true to that. Again, the Lord says, let them, let them say their fake dreams because that doesn't change people for real. My word does. Verse 30, therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, who steal my words from each other. Behold, I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, who use their tongues and declare, the Lord declares. Behold, I am against those who have prophesied false dreams, declares the Lord, and related them and led my people astray by their falsehoods and reckless boasting. Yet I did not send them or command them, nor did they furnish this people the slightest benefit declares the Lord. And so, yes, he can communicate through dreams, but one, it's very rare. Two, I think you could argue whether that still happens today, but how can we tell when somebody's actually delivering what God gave them or not? Well, there's really only one filter. Is does it line up with God's word? 
Because there are major dangers of being a dreamer. And I can't tell you as a pastor genuinely how many times I have met with somebody who has told me, but God gave me this dream. Or I know he wants this from me. And then what proceeds is pure mysticism. I know this is what God wants from me because I saw this cloud and I was praying, God, show me a sign and this cloud formed something and it looked like a cross and clearly God was talking to me because there was a cloud that had a cross and I asked him at that moment, so it must be God's truth. I'm supposed to go do X, Y, Z. Oh, and I've talked about this one before at our old church, the individuals that the two were married at the time and they raised their hands to praise the Lord and their hands touched and it was male and female, and they were both said that they knew at that moment that God was telling them that they're actually supposed to be married to each other and not their current spouses, and got divorced and married each other. And we sit there and we're like, no way, not possible. I sit endlessly with individuals across the desk and ask them themselves, do you think that what you're doing is sin? And they will say yes. And then within a week, they will respond to me and say, you know what? God actually gave me this word this week or he gave me this feeling of peace that actually everything's okay. I think I'm just gonna keep living this life of sin. I cannot tell you how many times that has happened. I have lost friends. I have even had major problems with my own family members because of issues like divorce. Like, hey, I'm dating this girl who's divorced. I'm so excited to marry her and I'm sitting here and I'm like, that's not what God's word says. I, I can't support that. God's word says that if you divorce somebody and you're still uh, that individual is still alive, you can still reconcile, that you're not supposed to remarry. It's adultery. And I know that, un- that offends people, but the reality is it's what God's word teaches. And so I offended somebody by saying that. I said, I cannot attend the wedding. I cannot endorse this relationship whatsoever because it's outside of God's word. And they proceeded to tell me all of these instances of how they ran into this individual at parties. And literally one was a bar Oh, we were at this bar, we were at this party. Like, how come we ran into each other like five times in a row in a week if it wasn't God's will? Clearly it was God's will. He was using extra biblical stuff to show me his will. No, when his word clearly says what you're doing is wrong, the thing is we're looking for endorsement to support our sinful behavior and we see it all the time. I especially handle it all the time. But people tell me, but God spoke to me. He spoke to me through this thing that is fanciful. And hey, he's done it different times in the Bible, so therefore, it must be God, right? Well, it's very hard for the normal person to sit there and debate that with somebody. Again, it is hard, but when you have God's word and you understand God's word, it's actually pretty simple to say, hey, listen, let me point you to the scriptures that show you where this is inaccurate. God doesn't contradict himself. So I actually don't think God wants you to marry the person who's already married. Why do I think that? Because God's word says it. So I don't think he came to you in a dream and then told you something completely opposite. Not only do I not think I would unequivocally stand on that, that that is wrong, and yet that's what these individuals do. Hey, I've had this dream. These men in the same manner also by dreaming defile the flesh, reject authority, and revile angelic majesties. So before we dive into those things, let me just say that there are two dangers in what I just said as far as dreamers go. Number one is that we reject everything that someone claims is from God. I don't believe that's accurate either. Can God speak through unusual circumstances? Absolutely. Do I still believe that there are parts of the world where God may communicate through dreams or supernatural things? Yeah, absolutely. Who am I to put, a, to put God in a box? God can do whatever he wants. So to unequivocally just say, there's no way God would ever do anything outside of the Bible and put in a man's heart to do something, I think is unbiblical and incorrect. So to just reject all facts that God can move in somebody through his Holy Spirit, I think is wrong. However, again, the other massive danger is, and the one that I have run into much more than the other, is accepting what somebody says without filtering it through God's word. Oh, well, if God gave you this dream, who am I to say that it's not true? Hey, if God told both of you you're supposed to divorce your spouses and marry each other and have affairs, who am I to say that it's not true? Well, if you're a Christian, you're you're exactly the right person to say it. Pull out God's word and say, but here's what God's word says. So why do you think this emotion you had when you touched an attractive person was God speaking instead of your natural sinful response to something? 
and yet we convince ourselves that it's God speaking. See, Jude says this is what these men do, and he talks about defiling of flesh, rejecting authority, and reviling angelic majesties, which we've already covered two of these prior to this. Jude was, again, reminding them that these are the men who defile the flesh. They participate in and they promote things that are wrong, such as promoting homosexuality or other things that are clearly outside the order of God's creation. Hey, we love everybody. At this church, it's okay. You can, if you want to be a girl, you can be a girl even if you were born a man. If you were born a... You, we're, we're all covered by grace, not a big deal. God doesn't care. We think that's loving, and people are still preaching that now, but again, as we're seeing here in Jude, they defile the flesh. They go against what God word, God's word says. They use grace as a license to sin. They abuse what Jesus Christ did on the cross and say, who cares, you can do whatever you want. So that's number one. If you find a preacher that says that, hey, it doesn't matter. You can do whatever you want. It's all covered under grace. There is a smidgen of truth there. God's grace does cover all. But if you are under God's grace, it doesn't mean you get to do whatever you want. There comes stipulations with being his. So if you find a preacher or a teacher that says, hey, whatever, it's all good. We're just trying to love you. That's not love according to God's word. Number two, these individuals reject authorities. Again, we had said this earlier. Jude starts with this. They reject the lordship of Jesus Christ in the way that they live. They abuse grace, and they use it as a license to sin. They say, hey, I'm a Christian. I'm fine. I can pretty much do whatever I want. The Bible says that his blood covered all my sins. So now that I'm a Christian, I can just live however I want. He's going to forgive me. That's abusing the lordship of Jesus Christ. That is rejecting the authority that God has set up within the Bible. The third thing they do is they revile angelic beings. Or maybe your version says they blaspheme glorious ones. What does that mean? Well, it means that they reject God's messages, what God has actually delivered to the people. They go where they shouldn't, and they claim that they're speaking for God. They go outside the boundaries of what God actually gave them as a preacher or teacher and says, hey, I've given you my word to teach others, right? That's the great commandment, to go and teach people God's commandments. He said, I've given you that command, but you've gone way outside of it, and now you're creating your own words that are not God's words. Those are those who revile angelic majesties. And he goes on to give an example in verse nine. He says, man, these false preachers are willing to reject God's word when even the angels don't do that. Look at verse nine. It says, but Michael, the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Now that's a weird verse, right? It's kind of a confusing verse. And some of you may be like, man, I don't ever remember reading anything about this in the Bible. That's because it's not in there. There's absolutely zero reference to what is being talked about whatsoever. In fact, in history, there's only something called the assumption of Moses or the testimony of Moses, which even among scholars is debated, was it one book, was it two books? So th there's this book that existed. We know it existed because a whole lot of people reference it. And what they do when they're referencing this book called The Testimony of Moses is they say that it closes out with this story of how Michael and Satan debated over the body of Moses. And it goes into detail as to what they debated over. Now, us in current history archaeology, we do not have The Testimony of Moses. We have snippets from it, but we don't have that specific story there. What we do have is a whole lot of papers where people wrote referencing that book and said this is specifically what that book says. So in other words, it would be like you read a New York Times story. I don't know why you would, but you read a New York Times story and you've read it and 20 of you reference an exact spot and you quote it specifically. And 100 years from now, somebody says, I don't know if that story was ever written because we can't find that specific New York Times story. But what we do have is 20 people who quoted the exact same thing saying that they got it from this article. So we probably believe that article existed. Well, that's what's going on here. In our current day and age, in 2023, we do not have the testimony of Moses. But what we do have is a lot of people that lived thousands of years ago that said they read the book called The Testimony of Moses. 
And at the end of it, it described this dispute between Michael and Satan. Well, Jude here references that book. He actually quotes what it says in that section. And so what Jude is relaying is being inspired by the Holy Spirit. So clearly this actually happened. But as far as the context of what's going on, we don't have any biblical sources to go to. So it's all conjecture if we go much further and say, I bet here's what was going on. But what we do know is what was described in this extra biblical resource is it said that Satan went to get the body of Moses when he was dying, which is only mentioned in Deuteronomy 24. It's actually an obscure verse, if you all have ever read it. It's like, what happened to Moses' body? It actually talks about Moses went and he died, and his body was hidden. That's it. That's all we get. We don't get any long procession. We don't get his bones were taken somewhere. We get nothing else. Total silence. And it's kind of weird. The actual silence on it is kind of unusual. Well, in this extra biblical source, it says that Satan and Michael are arguing because Satan goes to get the body of Moses and tells Michael, hey, you have no rights over this body. This guy's a murderer. He is an awful, terrible human being, so there's no way God has a use for him. And Michael's response is not, no, actually, let me list all the good things that Moses did. Let me do anything. No, Moses, or Michael's response is, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. Who are you to be a judge? That's God's role and God's role only. So Michael, the archangel, was like, I'm not even going to sit here and debate with you, Satan. It's not for us to determine who God's going to use and how he's going to use them. We actually only see that one other spot in the Bible in Zechariah 3, 1 through 5. We see something kind of similar to this. Look at this. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him, because that's what Satan does. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and standing before the angel, and he spoke and said to those who were standing before him, saying, Remove the filthy garments from him. Again he said to him, See, I have taken your iniquity away from you and will clothe you with festal robes. Then I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments while the angel of the Lord was standing by. So what we do have a reference of in Zechariah is that Satan is sitting there accusing Joshua, the high priest at that point of Israel, saying, Israel is awful. Joshua represents them. They're the worst ever. Come on, God, don't you remember? They've gone against you. They've all this stuff. And the response is, the Lord rebuke you. How dare you determine what is, what is filthy that I have actually said is clean. In fact, take off his, his filthy clothes and clothe him with righteousness because I'm making Israel righteous. I'm doing that. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. You don't get to stand in the, in the position of judgment. That's God's and God's alone. And so I believe that that is what is going on here in verse 9, is that what Jude is saying is that even Michael did not dare to tread where he shouldn't. Even Michael the archangel did not abuse God's word and say, you know what, Satan? Let's have a discussion over what we should do with this body. But these teachers, these false teachers, are actually doing specific, specifically that. They are pretending to speak for God through dreams. They are actually going far beyond what God has told them and making up stuff because it just feels right to them. And they're teaching outside of God's word. How do we know this? He goes on. Verse 10. But these men, these false teachers, revile the things which they do not understand and the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, by these things they are destroyed. We see something similar to this in Colossians 2, 18 through 19. I don't think we have it on the screens, but this is what Colossians 2, 18 through 19 says. Let no one keep defrauding you and your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of the angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind and not holding fast to the head from whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and the ligaments grows with a growth which is from God. So again, what is he saying in Colossians 2? You've got these, these preachers that are teaching you this false stuff. They're just, they're just coming up with all kinds of things, arrogant things, these visions 
that's all about themselves that is rejecting what they specifically have gotten from the head of the church, Jesus Christ, from his word. And listen, if we don't live in a day and age where that is so common these days, one of the most common things we hear, especially in Western Christianity, is I want a new word from the Lord. The, God, the Lord has given me a new word. I just want a new fire, a new whatever it is, God. If you would just, oh God, we're just begging you, give us a new word. He has given us all we need right here. Literally all we need right here. Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. You accept him as your Lord and Savior, you receive his Holy Spirit. You have his Holy Spirit, his word, and his people. You don't need somebody standing up here saying, well, actually, God gave me a dream, and I have this new vision that we're going to love people better than even God has in his word, and we're just going to accept all sins. We're going to be a church that's okay with everything because that's actually what Jesus would want. He gave me a new word that is so common these days, and it is so false. It is people inflated with themselves that are absolutely and utterly defrauding you and defrauding God's word by saying that God gave them a dream. He didn't give them a dream. God doesn't contradict himself. He doesn't go against his own word. Just get in his word to see what he actually says. Why do teachers do this? We're coming to the last three things that I want to talk about. These teachers ignore God's word. You know what, let me pause because I know for 100% fact there's going to be some people that ask about Moses' body after this, okay? So let me just give you a quick interjection. Here's why I personally believe uh, the, the fight between Moses or Satan and Michael, um, which is kind of touched on in this testimony of Moses, is if, if Satan had Moses' body, I don't think he would have like reanimated it. I don't think we're talking about like zombie type stuff here, as much as some of you probably want to find zombies in the Bible. Um, it's not one of those things. But what I do believe is most likely what Satan wanted was Moses' body so that it could be buried somewhere, like a prominent spot with a huge, beautiful something on top of it, a mausoleum or something like that, so that for all time after that, people could journey across the globe to see this great, wonderful, amazing Moses, who was the greatest man that ever lived and performed all these miracles. And all of these stories would come out so that people would worship Moses for thousands of years. While God wanted him buried somewhere far away in obscurity because Moses was just a tool. Moses is not the point of the Old Testament or the first five books or anything like that. He's just a chosen individual by God. The glory needs to go to God. And so I think that's why Satan wanted Moses' body specifically. He wanted a huge parade. He wanted all kinds of stuff so that people forever would worship Moses and in memory of Moses instead of the Lord. So I think that's kind of what was going on there. But let's move on into really what I wanted to dive into. And it's not going to be super long, don't worry. But I wanted to look at these false teachers. How can we tell what they look like, who they are? Does the Bible give us examples? Yes, it gives us three. Verse 11, woe to them, right? Woe to these false preachers, these false teachers. For they have gone the way of Cain, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Isn't it interesting that most of the churches that claim to get this new word from the Lord and be, I'm so full with the Holy Spirit, he's given me a new prophecy this morning. Isn't it amazing that almost all those churches are busting at the seams? The pastor usually drives at the very least like a C-class Mercedes. Something like that. They're calling in for orders. They're, they're gonna give you special prayers if you give more money. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of things that come with that, but isn't it amazing that the largest churches in America are all those types of churches. And people have asked me so many times, Pastor Bill, why do you think our church isn't like busting at the seams? And there's a lot of probably responses that I could give. And probably, to be perfectly honest, part of it is probably my personality, and I hate to say that. I wish I had a more, a lot of things. I wish I was a funnier, friendlier, whatever it might be, right? And unfortunately, a lot of times we choose churches over the, the charisma of the pastor, right? But I think there is a smidgen of truth here, and I've had other people tell me this more of encouragement. I do believe there is a smidgen of truth. And this is not to toot my own horn. This is just reality. It's because we preach truth here, and honestly, people hate truth. They do. We raise our hands saying, I want truth. 
And true believers do rejoice at truth. They rejoice at conviction. They rejoice at reading God's word and saying, yes, Lord, I want to learn more of what you require of me and I wanna be like you. It hurts. Listen, it hurts. Preparing sermons hurts. It's always convicting. It is humbling. It is difficult to sing a song that says, Lord, in all I do, I honor you. I mean, who can say that for real? Do you not have to change the words, Lord, I try, I want, but I don't sit here and sing, I, in all I do, I honor you. Like, no way. That's what we want. But I tell you, if you're used to having your ears tickled and a whole lot of fluff, when you hear truth, you don't like it because it's a hammer. And you're going to go down the street where you can get coddled. And it's just reality. And I'm not just trying to promote myself or extra Bible church. I'm trying to promote truth. From the beginning of time throughout the Bible, people run from truth. All throughout when Jesus went and preached places, what does it close with? And the myriad of crowds said, yes, I want to be saved. No, it says they turned and said, who can listen to this? Who can live like this? I'm out of here. And Jesus turns to his disciples and say, what about you guys? Are you going to go? And they say, where else would I go? You have truth. But truth is hard to find and it is why you will find dreamer churches packed to the brim and truthful churches always a little bit more small. But this is what those individuals do. They go the way of Cain. So what does it mean by going the way of Cain? Well, Cain worshiped God his own way. He said, I'm gonna ignore and disobey God's commands. I'm not gonna give an offering by faith. Some sort of interaction had to have happened between the Lord and Adam and Eve that says all sacrifices must require blood. We see that in the New Testament. We see that built throughout the Bible. We don't see that specific interaction in the Old Testament, but what we do see is that Cain was a farmer and he brought his agricultural goods as a sacrifice to the Lord. And Abel brought a blood sacrifice and the Lord accepted Abel's and rejected Cain's. And Cain killed his brother out of frustration over it. Verse one in Genesis four, verse one. Now the man had relations with his wife Eve and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man child with the help of the Lord. And again, she gave birth to his brother Abel and Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. And Abel on his part also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offerings. But for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. See, we have right out the gate, Jude is pointing back to Cain. Listen, these people go like Cain does. Well, what did Cain do? He worshiped God the way he wanted to. Yes, I know, God. I know your word says that I'm supposed to actually have a blood sacrifice. I'm supposed to give you the first fruits. But listen, I'm a farmer. I have to go talk to Abel. It's going to be hard to get, it's going to be hard to get actual like animals. Then I have to get bloody. I have to do, I'm going to worship you my way. But it's going to be cool because, you know, we're cool like that. Like, I'm Cain. I'm the first child born. Like, I'm literally the first child ever. I, I probably have some sort of standing. I can do what I want, right? I'm special. Lord, I'm going to worship you how I feel I should instead of how you told me I must. And he rejects Cain, and Jude is saying that. They go by the way of Cain. I mean, how many preachers and teachers do we know these days who worship God their way? Because it's more comfortable. It's just easier to do than the way that God actually commands us. So you will know a false preacher because they just want you to worship. Hey, worship God any old way. It doesn't matter. Remember, it's just a relationship, not a religion. God doesn't actually have restrictions for you or commands. Yes, he does. He does actually have demands from you because you're his and he purchased you with the blood of his son, the most precious commodity ever in existence. So yes, there are things we need to do. And so when a preacher tells you, eh, it's fine, do whatever, just worship God your own way. Do what feels good to you. You're in the presence of a false teacher. How about Balaam? What's up with this Balaam guy? Boy, this is a fascinating story. And again, we've probably got like 10 more minutes, but we're going through these. And these are narratives, so it keeps you certainly interested. What's going on with Balaam? 
Why is Balaam brought up? What kind of preacher was he? Well, he's one who did this for money and status. He only did it for money and status. He didn't actually care what God's word said. He just wanted to present a message that would make him rich and make him powerful. We, we don't know of any preachers like that, right? They'll just say things to make themselves rich and powerful. No way. To make people happy with them. No way any preacher could fall for that. I will tell you right now, I struggle with that every single week. I've said that before. Every time I have to confront any individual with sin, I would so much rather compromise because I want to be liked and I want to have friends too. It's not fun being alone. It's not fun being hated. And it's not, being, it's not fun being ostracized. It's just not. And I'm, I'm being, like, it's not easy. So sometimes you just, it's not easy. So I understand how they fall for this stuff. But here's Balaam in Numbers 22. So he sent messengers, there's this king, he sends messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor at Pethor, which is near the river in the land of the sons of his people to call him, saying, behold, a people came out of Egypt. Behold, they covered the surface of the land and they are living opposite me. Now, therefore, please come curse this people for me. Since they are too mighty for me, perhaps I may be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. So again, you've got this king of this land. He's afraid of the Israelites. They're coming out. He's hearing all these stories. And he's like, hey, I need these people cursed because I'm afraid they're going to come mess with us. So he goes to a guy who's known to be a prophet of multiple gods, as we discover throughout other texts, that he's a prophet. But he's like, hey, you seem to have this word. I want you to go curse these people. So verse 7, so the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the fees for divination in their hand, and they came to Balaam and repeated Balak's words to him, which even right there goes to show you the very fact that they were bringing money to begin shows you the type of character that this individual was. He's like, yeah, I'll give you a word from the Lord if you pay me enough. Going on, and he said to them, so uh, they came to Balaam and repeated Balak's words to him. And he said to them, spend the night here and I will bring back, I will bring word to you as the Lord may speak to me. And the leaders of Moab stayed with Balaam. Then God came to Balaam and said, who are these men with you? And Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent word to me. Behold, there's people who came out of Egypt and they cover the surface of the land. Now come, curse them for me. Perhaps I may be able to fight against them and drive them out. And God said to Balaam, do not go with them. You shall not curse the people for they are blessed. So Balaam arose in the morning and said to Balak's leaders, go back to your land for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. And the leaders of Moab arose and went to Balak and said, Balaam refused to come with us. Seems like he's a pretty good guy so far. Verse 15, then Balak again sent leaders more numerous and more distinguished than the former. They came to Balaam and said to him, thus says Balak, the son of Zippor, let nothing I beg you hinder you from coming to me. For I will indeed honor you richly, and I will do whatever you say to me. Please come then, curse this people for me. And of course, Balaam's response is, no way, no how, just go away. God already told me his word. God's word stands. He doesn't change his mind. I'm a man of God. Well, verse 18. Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could do nothing, either small or great, contrary to the command of the Lord my God. Sounds good, sounds pious. And now, please, stay here tonight, and I'll find out what else the Lord will speak to me. And God came to Balaam at night and said to him, so here's, again, he doesn't send him away. He says, hey, you guys are dignified, you got a lot of money. How would you all stick around? I know I told you yesterday what God said, but maybe he'll change his mind. I'm going to go back to bed tonight, let's see what happens. Don't leave yet. What does God say to him at night? God came to him at night and said to him, if the men have come to call you, rise up and go with them. So this time God says, oh, all right, you're you're coming back to me again, huh? Think I'm going to change my mind? Sure, go ahead, go with them. And when you go, you better say what I tell you to say. So Balaam arose in the morning and saddled his donkey and went with the leaders of Moab. Now, if you continue that story, he heads down there to give this prophecy and His donkey sees an angel of the Lord holding a flaming sword that they cannot go forward, and he starts beating the donkey, saying, you know, what's wrong with you? And then the donkey turns around and looks at him and says, dude, stop hitting me. Literally speaks to him. 
says, I've been a great donkey for you, have I not? Like, there's an angel with a flaming sword in front of us. I'm not going to go forward because he's going to kill us. And then the Lord opens his eyes and he sees it. So even a, a dumb donkey was able to know that this is, he was going against God's will and doing what he wasn't supposed to do. Yet he continues to go, and here's what happens. He continues to go, and he actually does prophesy over Israel, except he blesses them. And the king gets so mad, and he's like, dude, you were supposed to curse them, and you just promised good for them. I'll give you more money. Try this again tomorrow. And they tried again, and they tried again three times. Every time he opens his mouth to curse Israel, but a blessing comes out. And part of us actually reads into that story and says, well, I can't really blame him. But God gives us a peek in Joshua 24, 9 through 10 as the actual heart of Balaam. This is the Lord speaking in Joshua 24, 9 through 10, recounting things to Israel. He says, Then Balak the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and fought against Israel, and he sent and summoned Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. Listen, but I was not willing to listen to Balaam, so he had to bless you, and I delivered you from his hand. And what this verse teaches us is that that whole time, Balaam, every interaction he had with God was, I'm just going to curse these people anyways. I'm going to go. Maybe he just stays in this land, and if I go, God's not going to actually know that I go and curse these people. So Balaam was telling the Lord, hey, yeah, I'll do whatever you want me to. I'm going to go down there. But the whole time he's arguing, saying, I'm going to go down and curse these people, whatever God said, because I want the money and I want the status. The king of this land said he's going to give me all kinds of stuff, and he's going to honor me if I'll just curse them. So what's the big deal? I'm going to go down there. But God says when he opened his mouth, he forced Balaam to bless him. So Balaam was one of those pastors that was willing to say whatever he could to be liked, to be rich, and to be powerful. And there's a whole lot of people that use the Bible to obtain those three things. The final one, before we close and go into communion, is Korah. And I would actually say this is the most common one that I have run into. So Korah is the preacher, teacher who says, everything is fine. Don't worry, God's with us. Those other, those other pastors, those other preacher people, they take this stuff way too serious. We're good. Don't worry about it. So what's going on in this scenario is number 16. You remember last week we looked a little bit at numbers 13 and 14. They had spied out the land. They came back. Numbers 14, they rejected what they brought back. And God says, well, then your entire people, other than Joshua and Caleb and his kids, are not going to be able to go into the promised land. Y'all are going to be wandering for 40 years. You're going to be destroyed. And he gives the law down to Moses. They have these interactions, and the people continue to reject God's word. And right before this, in Numbers 16, you have a guy who on the Sabbath decided to work. And this is new to them, right? The law is new to them. But Moses has literally God's words written with his own finger that says, honor the Sabbath. If you don't, you will be killed. Well, what happens on the Sabbath? Somebody said, I'm going to go do my own thing. And what do Moses and Aaron do? They say, kill him. And they kill him. And so what's the response from people like Korah, who's a leader? This is what Korah says following that interaction. Number 16.1, now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, with Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and the son of Peleth. I should have started in verse 2. Son of Reuben took action. And they rose up before Moses together with some of the sons of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation. Listen, these were leaders chosen in the assembly, men of renown. So again, you've got the super popular You've got, the, you've got the leaders, you've got 250 people, you've got the men of renown, and on the other side, you've got two guys, Moses and Aaron. And these guys stand up, and what do they say? They assemble together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, you have gone far enough. Listen to this. For all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is in their midst. So why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? What is Korah saying? Listen. Moses, Aaron, you guys are saying we've got to do like sacrifices. We've got to follow rules that God's holy. We can't interact with them. Like there's special things for Levites, priests and all that. Dude, 
We're all holy. We're all good. God's with all of us. You and Aaron, you take this stuff way too serious. I can't believe you killed that guy yesterday for disobeying the Sabbath. You're ridiculous. You think you speak for God? You think you're so special because you have God's word? You know what? We're all good. Don't you realize? We're all fine. Let's just all get along. That's what the message says. And then you'll follow up with this. Moses then says to him, fine, let's test to see who, whose word is actually God's word. And what does God do immediately? He opens up the actual earth and swallows up every one of those guys and kills them. And anybody else who followed them was instructed to be struck down. So that's the other preacher that you have. The one who says, listen, those guys who keep telling you, like, read your Bible, that, like, God chose you before time. Like, there's all kinds of doctrinal stuff. They're too serious about doctrine. They're too serious about theology. All they care about is that stuff. Don't worry about them. You're fine. Those are the ones that Jude are saying you better watch out for. Those are the ones who chase after instinct. Those are the ones who just do what feels right to them. And I'm telling you, especially as an individual who has grown as a person who understands God's word and grows in doctrine, that it is amazing to me how many things I myself have argued with older men throughout my life, my dad included, and other Bible preachers and teachers, where I've said things like, Man, I would never follow a God like that. I just don't believe that that's how God is. God's too loving to choose people. God's too loving for, I would say all these things that were just because inside of me, I was like, it doesn't feel right what they're saying. And then I actually got in God's word and started to read it and found out, oh wait, that's actually what God's word says. I'm still not overly comfortable with it, but it's what God's word says, so I better preach it and teach it and stick to it. See, the preachers are so used to, hey, listen, this is what feels good, and most people are like, hey, I agree with what feels good, so I also want to receive that word, so everybody's in a mutually symbiotic and happy relationship of blissful ignorance. We're all good, God's happy, he's amongst us all, we're all holy. Those other guys who say you actually have to do things according to God's word, those other ones who say you actually have to treat God as holy, that sin matters, that there's a sacrifice for sin, man, those are just those ivory tower, arrogant, angry, doctrinally driven preacher people. You don't want to be around those churches. You see how small those are? Those churches are awful. I mean, look, at God doesn't even bless those churches. That is the common conversation. And all I'm trying to do is point you to God's word and what Jude says. He says, you better beware of the preacher who tries to teach you to worship ways outside of God's word the preacher who is all about himself and status and money and popularity and won't tell you the hard truths. And number three, you better be worried about the preacher who's always walking around saying, hey, don't worry, everything's fine. You're good. God loves you just how you are. Just stay how you are. Stop, stop beating yourself up. Everything's fine. Because the real teacher and preacher of God's word says the only way everything is gonna be fine is through Jesus Christ, through what he did on the cross. And you are a sinner in desperate need of him. And there are truths in God's word that are not comfortable. And it costs you everything to follow him. It will change every part of you. And it is so worth it. That's truth. And Jude, Jude tries to warn us against preachers who will preach the rest, and there are plenty of them. So let us pray as we step into communion and remember what Jesus Christ did accomplish on the cross. And men, you can come forward while I pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, again, I pray that I'm never one of those individuals who spouts false things because it's just what I want. Lord, I pray that I would always stay true to your word, no matter how many opportunities there are to go away from it. And Lord, I pray for everybody in this room, Lord, especially for those that know you. We are commanded to teach your truths to others, whether we're preachers or not. And so, Lord, I pray that that truth that we preach is your truth, not what we feel is right, not what we want to be right. We don't get to choose to worship you how we want to, how we think we should. Lord, we don't get to say, I would have done it this way, or I think this would be more fair, or I don't know why God did it this way, or I don't like it. Lord, you are God. 
May we humble ourselves and abide by your truth and not the truths that we want. God, may we all follow teachers, preachers that are true to your word, and may we all spend enough time into, in it to know the difference between the two. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we close with communion, I just want to let you all know um, we're doing things just a little bit different. It's not vastly different. The um, elements are only going to go around once, but there's a little tray inside. So you've got the, the cup is on the outside, and on the inside is a smaller tray that has the crackers inside of it. So I know it's not where you're used to, but again, I think all of us can hold a cup and a cracker. Just take the cracker, put it between your hands, and hold the, hold the cup and pass it on to the next person. So it's a little bit different than we usually do. It's usually we pass twice. But from, from now on, most likely, it's that there's one. So it's got the cracker and the juice in the same cup. I just want to let you all know that. Um, again, before we go into communion, we are commanded by Christ from all generations on to do this in remembrance of him and what he did on the cross. And we take this very seriously. The Lord takes this very seriously. And so as the elements are being passed, I ask that you would take time between you and the Lord to get right with the Lord if there's things you need to get right with him about to pray that you're, that you're receiving this in the right way. You don't have to be a member of this church, but you do have to be a member of the body of Christ. You do have to be a believer in Jesus Christ. So we ask if you are not a believer in Jesus Christ to just let the elements pass by you when we do this. But again, during this time of passing, I just ask you all to spend time with the Lord and get your hearts right with him before we take this. So go ahead, man.
right, we're going to take the bread first. What Paul writes. Well, I'm, I'm going a little too quick, sorry. We have one more row. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. In the same way, He took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Take and drink. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, again, as we take communion, Lord, as we're reminded of your son's body being broken and bruised, pierced through for our transgressions, Lord, as he shed his blood for our sins. As you poured your wrath out on him that we so justly deserve. Lord, thank you for that ultimate gift. God, may that be what we always filter everything through, your son, his sacrifice. Lord, thank you for the love that was shown through Christ. Thank you for forgiveness through Christ. Lord, thank you that we can gather today in his name and worship you because of his sacrifice. God, I pray that we would take these elements seriously. Lord, I pray again as I deliver this message and feel wholly unqualified, Lord, I thank you that your son qualifies me. Lord, you've given me your spirit so I can read your word and apply your word. And God, may we all do that and may we be incredibly discerning in who we listen to when we dive into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So we respond, let's stand if we're able to sing. Lord, I need you.
when temptation comes my way. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you are my hope and stay. I cannot stand. And when and I, I cannot stand, stand, I'll call on you. Jesus, you are my hope. my parents house for a brief period of time on Thursday night and was sitting and talking with my dad and he used to be a a pastor and sometimes we talk pastoral things and uh, we both were talking to my mom about the moment you finish preaching how you go over in your head everything you've said and start to ask yourself what did I say that I didn't actually want to say and then you beat yourself up and now we live in a blessed time where you can actually go online and rewatch it if you want to torture yourself but some things are just like, eh, I wish I had done that differently or didn't flail so much or whatever. Uh, other times you're like, I really want to make sure this isn't misunderstood. And so just even sitting there, I always pray like, Lord, remind me of things that probably I shouldn't have said um, or need clarity. And I just want to say this real quick. A small church doesn't mean you're doing everything right, right? And a big church doesn't mean you're doing things wrong. And what's big or small is certainly very subjective as well. Um, but I don't want to be like, Man, the reason we're not growing like busting at the seams, although we're really doing quite well, um, doesn't automatically equate to, oh, well, the pastor's preaching truth and we're, we're doing things so good, you know, and the church down the street that has a thousand people, well, clearly they've compromised because they have a thousand. I don't want it to come across that way, okay? I, I don't want to say that. I will say, historically speaking, biblically speaking, most of the time that tends to be where those two camps would fall that you tend to get larger when you're willing to compromise and you tend to be smaller when you uh, speak truth. But there can be a myriad of reasons. So I think, you know, to touch on that real quick, I think our church could use a little help in all of us living out the gospel in our daily lives and inviting people to church and inviting them to different small groups and Bible studies and doing things in our lives and then bringing them here to hear more truth. Uh, I think I could be more friendly. We could do, there's all kinds of things that could help, right? My point was, truth is not popular. It's not. But Lord willing, you're going to hear it here. And there's always going to be a lot of places that are more than willing to tell you false stuff. And Jude gives us a whole bunch of examples of what that looks like and what to steer clear of. And that was the objective. So I just didn't want anybody walking away being like, yeah, we're so great because we're small. Or they're so, you know, I told my sister-in-law she goes to that mega church. They got 1,000 people. They're, my pastor just said they're preaching falsehoods. No, right? We don't judge people by me or my standards or you and your standards. We look at their fruit through God's word. We look at a preacher's fruit through his word, his own words. That's what we got to do. So I just felt that I needed to say that. Let's close with the ironic benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. You are dismissed.